Hello, and welcome to Fierce Conversations with Toby, the show where we talk about the hard things. I'm Toby Dore. In today's episode, we're going to discuss when innocence is not enough. Our guest today is Thomas DeBall, who has degrees in theology, journalism, and law, is a former staff attorney at the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, where he worked in both the trial and appellate divisions and tried 25 homicide cases. He lives in Boulder, Colorado. Welcome, Tom. It's a delight to have you here with us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I like to ask all my guests a question that gives us a peek into who you are to start off. What's your favorite color and what does that color say about you? Uh, I think green is definitely my favorite color. Uh, I like that it has so many shades. You can be very, very bright green. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's many muted shades of it. But particularly what it means to me is the starting of new life, uh, spring and hope. Uh, I live in a place where it has cold winters here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I like it. But I always look forward to spring when you see some green growing out of the ground. It seems like the cycle of life is starting again. And I'm a a hopeful person. So that's what I like. That's excellent. Those first green shoots that come up just seem to be so much greener than anything else. You know, I love that feeling too. You're my first person who's picked green, by the way. So I love that. I like that you can be different. So can you tell us about a crossroads in your life that pushed you in a different direction? Yes. For for most of my life, I wasn't working specifically in the legal field, but I'd always had an interest from a young age in criminal justice issues and prisons and prisoners and issues around crime. But I hadn't ever worked directly in that field. I was in publishing. I, I was. I worked in Congress for a while. I did a lot of different jobs. Uh, then, when I was in my mid forties, uh, I'd started a small business with my ex-wife. Uh, it made a little money, and I kind of had a chance to say, "What am I going to do with the rest of my life?" Mm-hmm. And, and I decided to go to law school at the age of 48. I love that. <laughs> and uh, I'm so glad I did. I, I didn't graduate till I was 51. And mm-hmm. obviously my legal career was not uh, particularly long, but it was wonderful. I love being a public defender. And I'm so glad that I took that leap at a somewhat advanced age, mm-hmm. that it really changed my life uh, in a good way. Well, we have something in common there because I just had this white picket fence life until I was 48. And then I went to prison and I got out when I was 51. So that was my big uh, crossroads in a new direction. (laughs) That's an amazing parallel. So we both started. It is, isn't it? At 51. But yes, yes, that is interesting, isn't it? So your new book, which I just love, I have a copy of it here, get it on the screen. When Innocence is Not Enough, The Hidden Evidence and the Failed Promise of the Brady Rule is just a fascinating book. I I was only able to get a copy just two days ago, and I have done anything but dig into this book. There's so many things in there. But in particular, you take on the Brady Rule. In 1963, the Supreme Court decreed the prosecution must share favorable information with the defense on the premise that the United States wins its point whenever justice is done. Well, that sure sounds noble, but what went wrong? Well, it was a great idea, but almost everything went wrong. Mm -hmm. To start with, the courts who adopted this rule initially, the Supreme Court, Even its members were divided about the rule and what it meant. And very quickly, because the law always is evolving, what it really means is what the courts say it means in specific cases. So what happened fairly quickly, instead of saying, all right, this really means that the prosecution, when they find favorable evidence for the defense, they have to turn it over, uh, they started narrowing the rule Uh, They started changing how it was applied, and very quickly it became something very narrow, and 
then they didn't really enforce it. Even when people failed, when prosecutors failed to turn over evidence and it happened to come out, uh, they said, oh, you know, you shouldn't have done that, but they really didn't do much. Um, uh -huh. And really, to without going into too much detail, the key problem was they said for a real Brady violation, the evidence has to be material to guilt or punishment. And the way they define material, which is a reasonable probability of a different outcome, is so slippery and vague that you can basically justify any decision. Mm -hmm. could just say there might have been a probability that if this evidence had been shared, it would have changed the results. But we don't know if it's a reasonable probability. Mm. So no harm, no foul. And that's yeah. what happens over and over in these cases. So prosecutor, there's no enforcement. So why why do it? Yeah, I could see that. And And the wording just has really devolved into something that anybody can find a loophole in it, which isn't very effective. Uh, absolutely. And uh, particularly because prosecutors understandably are not in love with this rule. Mm -hmm. uh, it tells them, you know, they're in the middle of a case, they're prosecuting someone they think is guilty, and suddenly they find some evidence that maybe suggests the person might be innocent. Well, mm -hmm. they don't want to turn over that evidence to the to the other side and help them win, help them lose a case. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're inclined not to do it anyway. And because they control the information, it's simple to do. And many, many, many times we likely never know that the mm -hmm. evidence ever existed. Right. When I came home from hearing you speak the other night in DC, I was telling my stepson about it. And he said, but that doesn't make sense at all. Are the police on the side of the prosecutors? And I said, well, of course they are. And he said, well, shouldn't they be on nobody's side? And, and that's really not how it works. So the police discover this evidence and they work with the prosecutors. So really, if there's evidence that shows that the, the defendants, something that might keep them from being found guilty, the only people who know it are the police and the prosecutors. And so if the defendants attorneys never find out about it, you know, no one even knows. Right. And and that's often the case. I mean, sometimes certainly the defense does learn about it early on and knows, mm -hmm. but in many instances they don't, and they really have no way of even knowing. And in particular, the case that I focus on in the book, the Catherine Fuller murder, where eight young black men were, I believe, wrongly convicted of her murder. Um mm -hmm. The evidence was never discovered until about 15 years later, thanks to a, a very intrepid and courageous Washington Post reporter who kept digging in the case and digging in the case until she finally uncovered the evidence that there was a, a much more likely perpetrator uh, whose, the, whose identity and background the government had completely uh, withheld. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that... So, you know, and I've learned withholding favorable evidence is now the leading cause of wrongful convictions because prosecutors want to win it even at any cost. But what's the cost to a society when an innocent person goes to prison? Well, as you can imagine, I mean, the cost is, is enormous uh, in terms of human uh, mm -hmm. loss and human suffering. Can you imagine anything worse than being an innocent person wow. and being convicted of murder and sent to jail? Mm -hmm. And you know the evidence of my innocence has to be out there somewhere, but I have no way of finding it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I don't know what else I can do. Uh, and obviously, when a person goes to prison for life, it doesn't just affect them; uh, it affects their family, their children, their parents even their friends, their community, the loss of their uh, skill, the loss of their creativity, the loss of their energy. Every their contribution to society. They, they might have been the ones to cure cancer. How do we know? We don't know what they could have been capable of. You never know. And obviously, there's also mm -hmm. a great financial cost. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it costs probably 
now between thirty five and forty thousand dollars to put someone to keep someone in jail for a year mm -hmm. in the prison at least. So multiply that by ten or twenty years by a few thousand people at least who are wrongly convicted, mm -hmm. and you, you're talking about millions, millions, if not billions of dollars mm -hmm. wasted. So uh, yeah, it's a but it's a horrible cost uh, that is preventable mm -hmm. uh, but right now uh, we're not preventing it well you know and there's another cost that we haven't even talked about and that's the cost of providing safety to the community so if if you put like in this particular case that your book is about eight young men ages 16 to 25 went to prison for this murder that you know it's not hard to see that they weren't guilty of this crime but whoever was guilty it remains out there and is a as a risk for the rest of society in fact i think the person that you feel probably was the likely suspect went on to kill a woman later in a very same fashion and now he is in prison but that woman's life maybe could have been saved if they had if justice had been their motive the prosecutor's motives absolutely the the person whose identity they hid uh, was running away from the scene where Catherine Fuller's body was found. It was in a garage. He lived just a few steps away. He already had a horrible record of violence, particularly against women. And he should have been a prime suspect as soon as they learned about him. But by the time his name actually came up, they had already arrested 17 young people. They said, this is a gang attack. We've solved it. It was this gang who did it all. And so they, they simply were unwilling to share this information and in essence have to say, well, if this guy did it, we were completely wrong. We mm -hmm. misled the public. You know, it's been in the news all the time. Uh, that's a very hard thing to do. But yes, this man who who they should have arrested and charged with Miss Fuller's murder did go to prison for two other violent robberies just in that neighborhood, both involving women. And eight years later, after he got out, while he was still in the halfway house, he brutally raped and murdered a young woman in an alley very close to where Miss Fuller had been killed in a very similar manner. And fortunately, at least then they stopped and caught him and he's serving life without parole. But it's certainly too late for that young woman. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's too late for her. And it's too late for the eight men who went to prison when they shouldn't have. Exactly. So, you know, it really seems like from a prosecution standpoint, there's no incentive to do the right thing. It seems that what really matters is a win, a conviction, so that the public believes justice was served, whether it was or not. And your book really brings this mindset into the open. What feedback have you gotten from prosecutors regarding your book? Well, I, I haven't really gotten a lot, but certainly in my work as a public defender, I knew a lot of prosecutors, and we would sometimes discuss these issues. And I think that there are many conscientious prosecutors who try to follow the law, but it is so vague and slippery that even for the most careful prosecutors, it's not easy to always follow the Brady rule. And certainly for those who are less uh, scrupulous, uh, it's just an enticement to withhold uh, information and there is, as you as you noted, almost no um, incentive not to do that other than their own personal honor and saying, mm -hmm. "I really, I really should do justice." Uh, but in a an adversarial system, that's a hard thing because you know people don't become prosecutors because they're kind of laid back uh, mm -hmm. personalities. <laughs> they're you know, they're hard driving people. Mm -hmm. They're pursuing justice uh, in mm -hmm. their mind in the system. But I think in in that adversarial situation and then with the desire to win, 
uh, it's easy then to convince yourself, I don't need to share this information. This really wouldn't be favorable. It really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to risk it. There's really no consequence. So they don't do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, prosecutors don't get promoted because they lose cases after they share favorable information. Mm -hmm. They get promoted when they win guilty verdicts. Uh, and the public is satisfied that justice has been done. Mm -hmm. but, and, you know, I bet most of the prosecutors, honestly, don't have the mindset that they're withholding information and prosecuting an innocent person. I think they probably genuinely convince themselves that they know what really happened. And and they have they hold steadfast to that belief, because if they let in the idea that maybe something was wrong with what they believe, then they would be wrong and they don't want to let themselves be wrong. Well, so the, I mean, they're human and yes. you know, they, they certainly, I, again, I, I think there's few prosecutors that knowingly want to convict innocent people. They're so mm -hmm. corrupt. They just say, I know this guy's innocent, but mm -hmm. uh, let's say uh, that, that happens very, very seldom. Yes, but I agree. They do get into tunnel vision. You know, they mm -hmm. investigate a case. They say, all right, this is our stuff. This is the evidence. I think this guy did it. And justice requires that he or she be convicted. Mm -hmm. So when this other possible evidence comes in that they realize, well, this could weaken my case or even ruin it if I hand this over. But I really think this guy's guilty. And so if I hand it over, uh, maybe a guilty person will go free. Mm -hmm. So I'm really just putting a little bit of my thumb on, on the justice scale in their minds. Mm -hmm. Easy thing to, to think. I just want to make sure that this guilty guy goes to jail. They're not right. thinking, obviously, I want to send an in, innocent person. Right, to, right. I agree with you. I don't think see, that's our mindset. Yeah, mm -hmm. That they may well be wrong because they're human as well and they make mm -hmm. mistakes. But it's hard when you're in the public eye like that mm -hmm. and when it's particularly a serious crime that people want solved. It's hard to say, whoops, I think we might have gotten it wrong here. We need to step back and, mm -hmm. you know, regroup. Um, that's very hard to do. And so it doesn't happen like right. it should. And, you know, this particular case you talked about that had been in the headline news in Washington, D.C. for a year or so before it came to trial. and everyone had a strong feeling about this case, the public. And, you know, the media, whether it should or not, it does have an impact on our justice system. I know when I was going through trial myself or through my court case, I was a high profile case. And I actually fell into a border box where I was presumptive probation. But the prosecutors came to my attorney and said, there is no way I can let her have probation because the media will crucify me. So, you know, the media does have an impact and the media wanted blood and the prosecution was willing to give it to them. And I think that you had said when I heard you the other day that because of the, um, what's the word, the, the horrificness and the violence in that particular crime, that the police made maybe a logical assumption that it had to be more than one person. And so they came up with this idea that it was a gang of kids and the gang just kept growing bigger and bigger and it fit their belief of what had to have happened. A absolutely. I mean, it, it was a horrible crime. Miss Fuller was a small woman, uh, less than five feet tall, weighed 99 pounds. And she was just brutalized, kicked and beaten to death and sodomized with a stick. It was, I mean, police call it the most shocking and senseless crime in the D.C. history. Mm -hmm. uh, there are probably are some contenders, other contenders, but it was a horrible crime, and people wanted it solved. Right. And so they said it was a gang, like you mm -hmm. said, it was a gang, and that was the only story that anyone heard for a year leading up to the trial. Uh, people just assumed that's absolutely what happened. And the only mm -hmm. question in their mind was who was in the gang, who who was actually right. guilty of this crime. But no one mm -hmm. said uh, publicly, at least, oh, this wasn't a gang. You know, how mm -hmm. do we know? But in fact, 
almost certainly it wasn't. And when you look carefully at all the evidence, uh, you can see there's overwhelming uh, evidence that it was one or two people mm -hmm. committed the crime. It never happened the way that the police and the prosecutor and the media proclaimed, but that mm -hmm. was the only story. Right. I mean, I think you said the area was so small that it would have been impossible for multiple people to be in that area. So there was a lot of things, I think, but the public wanted justice and the prosecutors believed they had a case and they wanted to do their job and keep the public safe. So right. I know. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the only evidence they had were the uh, coerced confessions of two teenagers. I mean, the only mm -hmm. substantive evidence of a gang attack was that they had no physical evidence, nothing on the scene mm -hmm. linked any of the defendants to the case. There were no independent eyewitnesses, that is, eyewitnesses who had no connection to the defendants or the people accused. Even though it happened in rush hour, uh, it was an alley, but it was with uh, busy streets on both sides, houses backing onto the alley. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they manufactured a case uh, on the coerced confessions of a couple of teenagers and that was that was what they had, but you know, confessions are very powerful. They and are, they and I think we day. could we could do a whole other podcast on coerced confessions because you know people say n nobody who's innocent would confess, and and that is not true. It happens all the time. Yeah, it it does, and I understand people think, well, I would never confess to a crime I didn't do, especially a murder. That mm -hmm. you know, I, we probably all think that of ourselves. Mm -hmm. But that's probably because you haven't been a 16, 17, 18 year old uh, black teenager uh, without a lot of life experience mm -hmm. being interrogated mm -hmm. under intense pressure by experienced detectives who basically tell you, lie to you and say, we have evidence. We know you were part of this murder. So mm -hmm. you can either help us and tell us about it and we'll go easy on you or you can go to jail for life. So what do you mm -hmm. want to do? Right. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, they'll say, I got a confession. Somebody put you in the scene when maybe it isn't even true. So there's a lot of reasons. I think that could be a whole different podcast. Maybe we'll have to think about that, but because it, it happens, it happens all oh, the time. Absolutely. In this case, they, they lied about the evidence. They're allowed to, I mean, the, the law says uh, specifically that they can lie about the evidence when they're trying to get someone to confess. Now, one good thing I should just note that we're finally recognizing how common that is. And at least with juveniles, Illinois last year became the first state to prohibit the police mm -hmm. from lying about evidence to juveniles during interrogation. Mm -hmm. Not They're really all. vulnerable. They're so yeah. vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And then Oregon did follow, and I think more states will do that, and hopefully they'll also extend it to adults because it's it's a highly coercive tactic, mm -hmm. particularly as someone who's not very experienced, uh, who may not know much how the system works. And when they say, oh, yeah, you know, all your friends said you did it, so mm -hmm. you're going to jail for the rest of your life unless you talk and tell us what we want to hear. Uh, that's incredibly powerful and also incredibly coercive uh, mm -hmm. for many, many people. And and a lot of times they'll say, if you tell us you did it, we'll let you go home. Well, that's not going to happen, but but they want to believe that because they're searching desperately for a way out of that interrogation room, the way Absolutely. back into their life. So and they'll at some, yeah, at some point that is, I'll say, I mean these. Kid said, I, I just wanted to get out of there. I just wanted to mm -hmm. stop the pressure. I said what I thought they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so taken together, the time inside for all eight defendants in the Catherine Fuller case totaled 255 years. And even though each one of these boys were offered deals, which would have resulted in a sentence of two to six years, they refused to plead guilty to something they didn't do. And the parole boards, you know, want to see accountability before they'll let you out on early release. So if you don't go before a parole board and say, I was responsible, I did this, I'm sorry, 
they don't let you have parole. And if you weren't willing to take a guilty plea to get early time, you're not going to be willing to tell a parole board that you did a crime when when the whole uh, core of what you stand for is that you're innocent. So it's kind of a no-win situation. Uh, absolutely. And, and I think it speaks both well of these uh, eight young men, mm-hmm. but also is just more proof of, of their innocence that uh, they could have been out decades or even after a couple of years, like you say, if they had said they did it. And uh, I think in that situation, I mean, I, I don't know what I would do if I uh, yeah. realized that I might well spend my life in prison or mm-hmm. as these guys did at least 25 years and maybe 38 years like one of them did. Uh, mm-hmm. If I just say, okay, I did it, I'll be out in two years and go on with my life, um, it's a powerful thing to say no, but they wouldn't ever trade their integrity for their freedom. They insisted on their innocence, and as a result, they had to serve basically their entire sentences before they could be released. Yes, yes, that's true. And I, I just find that amazing. And a couple of the defendants have passed away. One of them passed away in prison, and the other one passed away after he was out of prison. But all are out of prison now. I was in prison for 27 months, and it was an adjustment for me to come back into society. I can't imagine. These men served 35 years, 38 years. They served lengthy prison sentences, and all their formative and young adult years were spent behind bars. Do you know, have any idea of what their lives are like today, how they've adjusted? I think their adjustment has been remarkable. I, I have been blessed to be able to spend a significant amount of time uh, with some of them and, and certainly with some time with all of them. And despite what they've been through, they're remarkably uh, optimistic. Uh, they're not as bitter i i think i would be just livid uh, it's mm-hmm. hard to think if you've stole the best 35 years of my life uh i i, I don't know how i could even function but um they've certainly struggled because mm-hmm. they missed so much i mean just imagine coming out of prison uh in the the last year few years and never having held a cell phone <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. never had a driver's <clears throat> license or driven a car, uh, any of those ordinary things that we all do, uh, and combine that with as, and, and you know, this Toby, from your experience that prison is a grim, violent, dangerous mm-hmm. place. Yes. And anyone who has spent much time there, I think has PTSD that in prison mm-hmm. to survive particularly to survive 35 years in a federal maximum security prison. You're Mm -hmm. always on high alert. You have to be careful who you look at, what you say, where you go, uh, how you relate to people. Anytime you're in society, you're all, it's like being in a combat zone. Yes. You know, when I got out of prison, my brother, I was 27 months, nothing compared to what these men went through. Um, But it was a long time for me. And when I got out of prison, my brother thought, you know, he'd plan a really good weekend for me. And he took me to the movies. Uh, And there I was in a movie theater and it was totally dark. Their lights never go out in prison. You never have total darkness. And there were people sitting behind me and I could hear them moving and rustling. And I had this huge panic attack and I had to spend my whole movie time in the restroom. Because it was the only place I felt safe, locked in that small stall. It it's traumatic. It is truly traumatic. Right, and and they don't even feel comfortable walking down the street mm-hmm. because in prison you have to be careful where you look and who mm-hmm. you look at. It mm-hmm. you know you if you make eye contact with the wrong person, right, uh, you could be dead. So when you're walking down the street and thinking, you know, or interacting with people, mm-hmm. should I, I maintain eye contact? How do I relate? Uh, mm-hmm. It's very difficult. And again, it's a credit to these men that I think they are, they're working. Uh, most of them now have girlfriends. Mm-hmm. One of them just got married. Um, they are 
absolutely trying their best to try to reclaim a life and and have a life despite what was stolen from them. Mm -hmm. I met several of them when I saw you the other day in D.C. at the book signing, and I was really impressed. You know, they looked like they could be preachers or, you know, someone really out there. They were just dressed to the nines and they were so polite and and humble. You know, they had this humility about them that I just found so endearing. And actually, I'm going to be talking to some of them on the next episode of this oh, podcast. Great. And I can't wait to tell their stories. And what I really want to focus on with them is how they made made it through and how they adjusted after prison, because I think that's a lesson we could all learn from them. We all that's, face things that we think are going to be devastating, and that's nothing compared to what they've been through. I, no, I, I, I think that's a great subject because obviously in prison, everything is directed toward dehumanizing you. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the hallmark of virtually every maximum security prison in this country is a disregard for the possibilities or the values mm-hmm. of human And these guys decided at some point that they were going to take charge of themselves. They were not going to be numbers. They were not going to be victims. Uh, They were going to do what they could to realize their potential, to learn. Uh, A lot Mm -hmm. of them took all kinds of classes, read, uh, learned what they could, and tried to take almost the worst situation you can imagine and turn it into something that at least had some redeeming value and look forward not to the fact they might be there forever, but toward when they could be free and when they could be functioning again in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't wait for that interview. I think it's going to be awesome. So, you know, and the thing is, I don't, I'm not sure how long they've been out. It's been several years. Uh, it, for it, it's very that, that, Russell Overton, the last one released, was just released last April. Ah. He did 28 years. Most of them were released in the last uh, two to three years. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chris Turner, one of them who had absolutely no criminal record and a lot of good references, actually was the first one released uh, in 2010. But the other much more recent. So he Mm -hmm. did just under 26 years. The others all did uh, at least 32 years, and one did up to 38 years. Mm-hmm. So, And none of them have had any issues since they've gotten out. None of them have reoffended in any way. Is that true? Uh, that is true. Uh, mm-hmm. They still have trouble, though. It, you know, it dogs you because they do yeah. have the, this felony <laughs> conviction. Um, uh, initially, they're, they're all on lifetime parole. Oh, uh, <laughs> Because Chris had absolutely no violations after 12 years, Mm -hmm. they did terminate his, but the others are on lifetime parole. Uh, But things happen all the time. Like if they get stopped for a traffic stop, this happened to Chris a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, They run his record and see, oh, you're on lifetime parole Mm -hmm. for a murder. He would spend the night in jail just because his taillight was out. Yeah. Checked everything. It's been very difficult to get jobs uh, because they go on interviews. People Mm -hmm. like, oh, I I think that was great. Uh, Let us, you know, just do a few checks and we'll get back to you. And then they never do. Mm -hmm. They uh, suddenly see that this guy just spent 25, 30, 35 years in prison Mm -hmm. for murder. And they're like, sorry. Uh, I know. So I, it's, it's I can tough. relate. You know, I never was able to get a job when I got out of prison and I had been a corporate manager. I had college degrees, but nobody wants to hire you if you're a felon. And yeah. so I started my own business because I had to support myself somehow. But it is so hard. And sometimes it's hard to find a place to live too. a lot of apartment complexes. They do background checks and it's just really tough to come out and get started again. Well, and yeah, I mean, take take Chris. I mean, it's typical. Uh, he comes out of prison. They give him fifty dollars and a bus ticket back mm-hmm. to DC. Mm-hmm. And good luck. Right. Yep. Yeah. Nothing. That doesn't yeah. take you very far. Carly no. buys you two meals. You know. <laughs> so I I can relate. It's it's a really tough struggle. Um. So. 
Uh, Justice Douglas wrote, society wins not only when the guilty are convicted, but when criminal trials are fair. Our system suffers when any accused is treated unfairly. That seems to make so much sense, but it's not really how it works. I know when I listened to you at your book signing event, I was filled with rage against the injustice of this particular case. Most of us can feel outraged, but have no idea how we can make an impact. What can we do as individuals to make a difference? I think there are several things. I know it's frustrating when you think, well, I'm just one person. What can I do? Uh, The first thing, obviously, is to learn about the situation, to take time to look into it, to read, uh, to meet with people. And uh, then I I think two things specifically um, is that with the Brady rule, there are a couple of states that have realized that the rule is failing, that it's not working, that mm-hmm. prosecutors are regularly withholding uh, favorable evidence. And so they have passed law. This happened in North Carolina and actually in Texas, which neither of which are considered uh, highly progressive uh, <laughs> states with regard to criminal justice. But In response to some just really egregious examples of uh, Brady violations that led people, actually in both cases, people were on death row because of Brady violations who were absolutely innocent. Uh, People said, we have to stop this. So they have a state law that requires prosecutors to basically share their whole file with the defense. And it also requires some reciprocal uh, openness from the defense. But uh, in spite of, of prosecutors particularly saying, well, this will ruin the system, it can't work this way, it actually has. It's made the system more open, it's led to yeah. actually more pleas, it's led to fairer trials. Mm-hmm. And people can get involved in that, talk to their legislat- legislators about changing the law, because as things stand, judges, the system itself, is not going to correct it. We mm-hmm. we have to take decisions about the disclosure of evidence away from prosecutors and make it simply a requirement in any criminal case. And I think when we do that, if we can do that, and and people can influence their legislature, mm-hmm. legislators That's to true. do that, mm-hmm. that we could change this situation and wipe out what is currently, as you noted, the largest reason uh, behind wrongful convictions is Brady violations, Mm -hmm. hiding favorable evidence. I think another thing we could probably do to help is to make ourselves aware of these conflicts in our justice system. And when we are called to jury duty, rather than trying to find a way out of it, go and be a juror and be a fair juror who looks at the whole story and don't let yourself, you know, be blinded by arguments maybe that you see holds in. Right. Absolutely. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I would also say, I I think it's really important if people have the time to visit prisons, to visit prisoners, to meet these people, Mm -hmm. to realize that they're not there. They're not aliens and subhumans. They're people just like us who have Made, made mistakes, who have had struggles, uh, but who also still have hopes and dreams, and and um, many of whom uh, should probably not be there at all. Mm-hmm. And when we know them and get involved with their lives, we can make a difference. And they're really not scary people. You know, people think everyone in prison is, is a scary person to be around, and they're really not. There's decent people in there. And I remember when I was in prison, this women's group at a church came in two or three times a year and they brought in hairdressers and cut and styled our hair, which was such a blessing because, you know, it's just so nice to have someone giving you a scalp, scalp massage and cutting your hair and you feel like a princess yeah. again. You feel like a real person. And it's uh, such a beautiful thing. And there's those kinds of opportunities. There's jails and prisons everywhere. And if you're a member of a church or you're a member of a women's group or a Bible study or anything, you know, 
look for opportunities where maybe you could go in and do something to make a difference in someone's life. I think that's important. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Tom, is there a question you wish I'd asked you that I didn't or something else you'd like to share with us? Uh, well, you asked a lot of good questions. I, I think this, you, you didn't ask me why specifically why I wrote this book. Oh, that's right. That's a good question. Well, I, I did write it because, first of all, I was fascinated with the Catherine Fuller murder case mm -hmm. of how such a high profile case, such a, a brutal case, a case that was in the news everywhere, how it could go so wrong mm -hmm. and how these so many people could be wrongly convicted. So I wanted to tell that story, but I also wanted to be hopeful because as we touched on, uh, I don't think the Brady rule itself can be saved. Uh, I think it will always leave decisions on disclosure of evidence in the hands of prosecutors, and they'll always be conflicted about giving favorable evidence to the defense. And so we need to take it away from them, put it uh, in a legislative form that they have to share information. And I think they will, they can, mm -hmm. and we can make that happen. And if we do, uh, we'll be sparing hundreds and hundreds of innocent people's lives and all the collateral damage and cost that comes with wrongful convictions. We can stop. Mm -hmm that from happening with the Brady rule by changing the law. And then I think society wins. If we have fair and just trials, society wins every time. Absolutely. We all win. And, mm -hmm. and nobody wants a system that convicts in innocent people. Mm -hmm. We all want a system that is fair and just. And we've got to recognize we don't have that now but we can work toward it in a number of ways. I think that's beautiful. Tom, thanks so much for being here with us. I hope your book, When Innocence is Not Enough, continues to raise awareness and outrage people. Justice, true justice, is at stake. Thanks for taking a stand and, and uh, opening our eyes. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'll be right back with you, Tom. Remember, none of us is our worst mistake. We all have so much more to offer the world. And those so-called mistakes are blessed opportunities to learn and grow. Next week, we'll continue to bring you inspiring stories by people who've identified a need for change and are working to make a difference in the world. Subscribe to our Patreon channel, Fierce Conversations, for special access and behind the scenes info. Go to patreon.com slash fierce conversations or click on the link in the show notes. 10% of the Patreon proceeds are dedicated to providing workbooks to women in prisons. The show notes will also provide a link to purchase Tom's book, When Innocence is Not Enough, and a link to purchase my memoir, Living with Conviction. As I talk about in depth in my memoir, I had a conversation in prison where my friend Lisa told me, in here, we can talk about all the hard things. In fact, I think we must. And so we shall. This is Fierce Conversations with Toby, where we talk about the hard things. Until next time.